for there was the Jewish synagogue. Was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them for the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you, proclaiming to you, is the Messiah. He said some of the Jews were persuaded to join Paul, join Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, <coughs> jealous. When they heard this, the crowd in the city officials were thrown into turmoil. After pending time at Antioch, Paul set out from there and traveled from place to place throughout the region of and strengthening all disciples. So be it. <laughs> None of us knew how to pronounce them right either, so it's okay. I'm going to lay that right there, sweetheart. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you for your word. We know that it is truth. We thank you that it is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Open our hearts and minds today to hear your word today. Lord, help us to apply it to our lives. Help us in our relationships with each other, with our mothers, with our fathers, with our children, and so forth. Lord, we know that you are sovereign, totally in control of all things, and that you have placed us exactly where you want us to be to bring you glory and honor in the families, in the jobs, and so forth, Lord. So help us to be a light to this world. Help us to love others as Christ loved. And Lord, help us to even love our enemies, because if it was not for Christ loving his enemies, none of us would be in fellowship with you. We thank you that our salvation comes through faith, not by works of righteousness, Lord. So increase our faith so that we do the things that you have called us to do, to be the people that you have called us to be, holy, set apart, loving, and kind. And we just thank you and praise you as we're able to worship you freely today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I didn't read to you First and Second Thessalonians or Galatians, but maybe you did yourself. It would have taken you less than an hour, but I'm going to tie some of that together with Hebrews today, and we're going to talk about mothers a little bit too. I have entitled this Running Together, because if you're reading along in Hebrews and you read the letters to the church in Thessalonica and the churches in, in the province of Galatia, you see that this is a group marathon. This is not a sprint. This is not a single event, that this thing that we call life is a race. It is an endurance race where we fix our eyes on Jesus, where we live a life that is different than this world so that we can bring glory and honor to God, that we can draw others into the kingdom. And it's something that we can't do on our own. Even if we fix our eyes on Jesus, we need mothers and fathers and siblings and children and, and friends, and we need the church. We need the body of believers. Because sometimes you get tired, sometimes you fall down, sometimes you lose your focus on Jesus, and you need others to help you through that. This is a race, a church race that we're all going to race. It's a struggle. It's an endurance. It is something that you cannot do on your own, and God has brought us into fellowship with Him, fellowship in the Spirit, fellowship uh, with Jesus, and fellowship with one another. We are a family those that believe in Jesus Christ all have hope. They're all going to reach the finish line. They're going to live forever with God. Why don't you want to live with them now? <laughs> Come on. Because we have these estranged relationships, and let's boil them down. We even have them with our mothers and with our children, and we shouldn't. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love is patient. Love is kind. And you know love because God loves you so dearly. That poem or thing that Sherry read, I changed it a little bit from the original author. I said, he loves you ladies to death. 
because who else besides God Almighty that we have would give His Son to die for you so that you could be in a right relationship with Him and with others. So today is Mother's Day, if you didn't know it. If you woke up and didn't realize it, it's Mother's Day, okay? Mine's on the East Coast, so I'll call her later in the day. She knows that because if I get up, she's probably in church already or wherever, so I'll call her later. But I want to recognize her a little bit today. Is my mother perfect? No. Does she get on my nerves? Yes. Do I love her? Yes, I do. I love her so much. Can she be annoying and everything? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Can she try to give too much? My mother's probably one of the most giving people that I know of. To the point, oh, man. I want you to look at this. And you ladies get to take advantage of it. If you tell my mother something about you like something, she sends all kind of stuff. Barb, you know it, right? So she sends me these soap pumps. This is just one thing that she sends me, and all of you ladies will get one today. There's, a, there's every different flavor under the sun in here. And when she calls me, it's just an excuse to call me to say, are you out of soap pumps? Are you out of chocolate? And I'm like, no, Mom, don't send any more. I know, she did cookies forever, and we put them in the freezer and everywhere else, but she's off the cookie kick for now. (laughs) But she continues, and I'm like, Mom, if I wash my hands ten times a day for the rest of my life, there's no way I could use up all these soap pumps. Wash them more. Oh, no. (laughs) Okay, well, give them to Barb. (laughs) I said, Barb can't use them all either, and she literally said that. I said, she can't either, so she's like, give them to the ladies. She just has such a giving, giving heart. And, you know, I know she sends these packages out all the time. She sends these flat rate boxes. They're like $20 a box, and I get them every other day. And I'm like, Mom, please, slow down. But I want to do it. I want to give. And, you know, sometimes I don't understand that. I think it's overboard and everything else. And like I said, sometimes it's even the burden that we've got so much. So now I've got to clean out my bathroom closet to you ladies. But she has such a loving, kind heart. Why would I not want to see it that way? Why would I not want to thank her for the spirit that she raised me with to be loving, giving? Because she did take the time to, to train me up. She went to work so that I could go to a Christian school. She's a very generous, loving mother, and I just want to say Happy Mother's Day. Now, ladies, these are all different flavors right here. Will you help me pass some out? They get a candy and a soap pump. And then if we need to go over to here, there's some duplicates. And if you don't like your certain... uh, Sent, no, they just get to pull one out randomly. That's where I'm getting at. Randomly. randomly. Because then later it's going to give you the opportunity when you fellowship, when we're out there with the co- cocoa and the coffee, and I know we will be, that you can say, oh, what kind did you get? Oh, I got lavender vanilla. Well, I got sunshine citrus. Then you can ch- trade if you want to. Okay? But for right now, just grab one. The chocolates are all the same because I did not want any fighting out in the foyer. <laughs> Okay? Sherry, when you're done, you can come over to here. <laughs> no, no, when you're done, to get more, okay? So, as we read Scripture today, we're not going to talk so much about mothers, but we're going to talk about children. And there wouldn't be children without mothers, right? And as a child, we need to learn to honor our mother and father, to weigh them out, to thank God for them, to value them is what that means. To value them so that we can understand the loving relationship of God as a mother. Scripture's full of the references to that. And God as a father. So that we can understand love, so that we can love others. Because it's one of the hardest things, I don't know per se, but I hear her say it all the time, to be a mother. And I know it's hard to be a father, and I know it's hard to be a child, and a sister, and a brother, and a friend. Relationships are tough. But we've got to realize that the reason that we can love is because God first loved us. 
We also need to realize that Jesus said that that's how we'll be known as his disciples, the way we love one another. We also need to understand that love does cover all records of wrong. Love will endure forever. So I'm going to try to tie together some of Hebrews with some of 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and some of Galatians. If you haven't got a reading schedule, you're into 1st Corinthians now. And I apologize for making the mistake on uh, April's reading and you reread Matthew, but I guess it's a God thing and we reread part of Matthew. Now we're good on the text. All right, are we good? I haven't said a scripture yet, but I'm going, I'm going to Hebrews first, chapter 12. We're going to go there. And if you were here last week and if you've been following along, we saw all of those heroes of old and don't concentrate on necessarily what they did, but the fact that they are the cloud of witnesses before Jesus that lived their lives in hope of something they didn't even understand fully. You know who Jesus is. You know the compassion that He gave. You know that He gave up heaven and laid down His life for us. You know that He said it was finished. You know that the, the temple uh, uh, curtain was torn in two. You know that you have direct access to the Father, that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, that you are a temple, a royal priesthood. You know all these things. The Old Testament saints did not know that, but yet they are some heroic stories of how they lived their life by faith. That you believe, pissed us. And because you believe, you live differently than the way you used to live. You live differently than the world around you. And the world sees that. And they're going to want that. Because we do live in a fallen world. Relationships are tough. And when they see the love that you have in Christ Jesus, they want to know more about it. Peter writes that when we get to Peter, that, that when we get the opportunity because of the lives that we live, then we can tell them about our hope. So as we read through Hebrews, we realize that we have hope in Jesus Christ and we fix our eyes on Him. And I'll start in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, where it said, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, scorning its shame, it sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That's what we covered last week. And we talked about that, that it is a race that you need to throw off everything that hinders you. That's not sin because he speaks of sin next. And sins that entangle you. They could be the best things in the world. But if it keeps you from serving God and running this race running it, competing for the prize so that you don't run in vain. And I told you before, when you look at a runner that went into the, the games and he just coasted, he sat down, he walked away, you'd say, what a foolish runner. Now, we're in this run together. If you noticed, therefore, since we, not just you, me, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of crowd of witnesses, not one witness, but a bunch from the Old Testament. Let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so in easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance, perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of the faith. For the joy set before Him, He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider Him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you, plural, will not grow weary and lose heart. When you read that at first, you might just read that you and think it's about me running this race again. But it's not about me. That's the reason Jesus died on the cross and replaced sin, the I, with the O, which is the Son, so that we could love others and that we could run this race together with others. So if you keep on reading, then this race turns to something that you need to be disciplined for. And when we think of discipline, we think of it in a bad way reference. Just what we do. Oh, I don't want to be disciplined. That's bad. So the author talks about this disciplining and says that it's good. And he compares it to a father or a mother. And it's not right, ladies, to say, wait till your daddy gets home. <laughs> okay? You can discipline as well. And I know you ladies know that. 
but that you discipline for what reason? To correct that child so that the outcome will be what you want it to be. Now, if you do that in all of your failures and everything else, then God's discipline is to perfect you, to make you complete. So I'm going to cover chapter... 12 verses 4 through 13. In your struggle, you're being plural again, struggle against sin because this is a battle that we face. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, but that was coming for this church. We know what happened in the early church, that they were tormented tremendously, even to the point of the games and being burned as, as public lampposts. And you have and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addressed you as a father addresses a son? Plural again to this church. Have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement? This is to encourage you. No matter what the circumstances are, no poor, poor, pitiful me, especially on Mother's Day. No more poor, poor, pitiful me. God will work this out. I need to fix my eyes on Jesus. I need to be like Jesus so that others see that. I don't need to fall into the trap which Satan has got to snare me so that I don't run this race effectively. It says, my son or child, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. <clears throat> if you look in the next few verses, there are four verb uses of this ver word and three noun uses. I think it's important if discipline is used or disciplining is used seven times. Do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when He rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the ones He loves and He chastens everyone that He accepts as His Son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as His children for what children are not disciplined by their father. If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in His holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who who have been trained by it. Therefore strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees, make level path for your feet, so that the lame may not be, lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. This is the next section that the author goes into in this letter. All of these heroes and heroines of old live this way, and at the end of chapter 11 it says that God had something in plan for us that only together we would be made perfect. So we are heroes and heroines, and we know the name Jesus. So we should be running this race stronger than anyone ran it in the past. And as we learn from other scriptures, and even this scripture, that God is the one running it through us. Jesus doesn't only save us, but He says it's better for Him to leave so that the Holy Spirit can come, so the Holy Spirit will fill you, reveal all truth to you, sanctify you through and through. That's how when you get to heaven you won't have any desire to sin whatsoever because you are completely sanctified and that sanctification process has taken place and will continually grow you to maturity if you allow it. That's why you don't understand discipline at first. Looking back now, as the author says that, oh, that's why my mother or father disciplined me. Yeah, if I take myself back to those teenage years, I say teenage years, because when I was a young child, I probably didn't understand anything at all. But when I was older and started understanding things, what did I want to do? Rebel against their authority. Because it wasn't what I wanted. I didn't understand what they wanted for me was better than what I wanted for myself. And if my parents did that, and I can understand that now in maturity more, how much do we need to understand God's discipline so that we can be holy? It says in verse 9, Submit to the Father of spirits and live. If you don't submit to God and His power, you're not going to live the kind of life that He has called you to live. 
you're going to live part of a lie. You're going to live incomplete. You're going to live a life where you let the things in life discourage you and your relationships are going to fall apart rather than you loving unconditionally and even loving your enemies. God does this so that He'll give you life. And if you go on and read in verse 10, he said, at the end of verse 10 it says that we may share in His holiness. Because we live by submitting to God, we will become more and more holy, more like Jesus. And then if you'll notice in verse 11, here's what will happen. It produces a harvest, a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. That's the reason for the turmoil that you might think in your life. It could be a part of disciplining. The things that you don't want to happen to you, but you look back and say, oh, you know what? That actually strengthened my relationship. That actually strengthened my faith. It brought me to praying more. So therefore, verse 12, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees together. Help each other up. We've got this race to run. It's an endurance race. Make level paths for your feet. It can even, le even level out those highs and lows so that you can run more effectively. So that e the lame may not even be disabled, but rather healed. Isn't that what you want? Don't you want those relationships healed? Now, if you read in First and Second Thessalonians and Galatians, and it took about 12 minutes to read 1 Thessalonians if you just read through, only a few minutes to read 2 Thessalonians and Galatians didn't take more than 30 minutes. That's why this is called a five-minute plan. I'm going to say that again. Five days a week. So there is no reason you don't have time for it. And if the purpose is to train us, to fill us, to transform us so that we can live lives that please God and love others so that these relationships mend, why in the world would you not read 55 minutes? Or 555 minutes. Why would you not fix your eyes on Jesus and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us? These are the words of life and they're sharper than any two-edged sword. So if you read from 1 Thessalonians, do you see the same story? You see letters, we don't know who the author of Hebrews is, but we know who the letter of uh, Thessalonians were. And Galatians, they were written by Paul. And he's writing these for the same reasons. They're struggling with faith and they're being persecuted and some of them are turning away. The same reason that the author of Hebrews wrote. And the author of Hebrews wrote so that you'd be grounded in your faith and Paul writes for the same reasons. So in 1 Thessalonians we'll see a teamwork. Paul, Silas, and Timothy who are running this race. And we see Timothy as a young Paul training and mentoring him. And as we read on in the letters, we'll see that Paul on his deathbed was writing to young Timothy. And he sends out Timothy here to the churches and everything. He opens with a prayer of thanksgiving for those who are running this race together, this church. And in verse 3 of 1 Thessalonians, we read, We remember before our God and Father your work. What work? Work that was produced by faith. Your labor prompted by love and your endurance inspired by the hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't that sound a lot like what you read in Hebrews? And it's people working together because of who they are, because of their faith. They work, they labor, and they endure. But suffering comes along. Suffering which does what? Produces growth. If you drop down to verse 6, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering. With a joy given by the Holy Spirit. Oh yeah, fixing our eyes on Jesus who looked at the cross as something as a joy. And so you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Because this church in Thessalonica lived by faith, the world was talking about it. Other churches and even non-believers. Paul couldn't return to visit, so he sent Timothy. And in chapter 2, verse 18, we read, For we wanted to come to you, 
Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. This is this spiritual battle. That's why you have to strip off everything that hinders you and the sins that so easily entangle. Because Satan is going to do his best to make you ineffective for the kingdom. But he has no power, no control. It was finished when Jesus died on the cross. Verse 19, for what is our hope? Our joy, there it is again, fixing our eyes on Jesus or the crown in which we glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when He comes. Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. So we have this Christian fellowship together where I tell you about Jesus, you believe, and then because you believe, it inspires me to live more. When I'm thinking that this race is tough and I'm ready to give up and everything, I look back and say, look here, and it brings me joy. It's my hope. It's my crown for running this race. And let me tell you as a minister and let me tell you as Christians, you know that, that there are plenty of times when you feel defeated. You feel like, why am I doing this? That's when we need to pick up each other, encourage each other, and run this race together. The report that Timothy gave brought strength so that they would run even harder. Chapter 3, verse 8. For now we really live. That just gave them a burst of energy to run since you are standing firm in the Lord. So they pray, their prayer increases. Night and day we pray most earnestly. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. Look at this cycle that it's building. Because your faith has increased my faith, I'm going to increase your faith, and we're just going to get all excited and we're going to run. Okay? All the way to the finish line. Verse 13. May He strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with His holy angels. There is that day that we're, we're, we're longing for when Jesus returns, when every tear has been wiped away, when we realize that death has no sting because we see life. That death has no sting now. We need to live as though we believe that, that it's our hope. <coughs> <clears throat> they're living and loving so much that it's not only spreading out of their region, but it's spreading all over. In chapter 4, verse 9, Now about your love for one another, something that you see, it, words, I love you, don't mean anything if you don't act like it, if you don't do the things. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do it more and more. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, you should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. Here we go, out into the outside world. So that you will not be dependent on anybody. There was a problem in the church we can inflect from this that some people said, well, God is coming one day, so we're just going to sit back and take it easy. No, you're running a race. You have a job to do. And the fact that you do it more in loving one another, even the outside world will see it. But guess what they'll also see? They'll see your laziness, your complacency, they'll see you're quarreling with one another, right? Because so many times it's not the fact that when I say I love you that you don't necessarily believe me. It's your acts that you did that make me not necessarily believe you. I love you, sweetheart, but then five minutes later, what would you do that for? Right? Okay? So let's be loving and kind. Let's realize we're in this race. If we continue on in the chapter... We don't need to grow tired. The next chapter, actually, the point is running this race. Chapter 5, verse 4. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you. The finish line. Like a thief, you are children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep. Let us be awake and sober. You know, there's that story of the tortoise and the hare, and we all know that. That hare was so fast, he thought he was so good, but he sat down and took a nap, didn't he? And then he found out that the tortoise was making his way to the finish line, and it was too late for him. What runner knows that he's running a race, 
and takes a nap. Live as children of light. That means you live and love in the light of Jesus Christ. You don't stop because you're tired. You don't get mad because of this or that. You love. Love covers a multitude of sin. Love brings us all into completion and perfection. We love because Christ Jesus loved us. And His command is to love one another. And yes, it's hard, and yes, we need each other to lift us up when we get tired, when we get discouraged. So let us be a church that does that. You just got 1 Thessalonians in a wrap-up, okay? So let's go on to 2 Thessalonians and see what Paul wrote again. These are some of his first letters to the churches, and I read to, had Merle read to some from Acts so you could tie it together with Acts. 2 Thessalonians some things are getting worse, but some things are probably getting better. It's typical of our church life, again, so, because we fight a spiritual battle, and wherever there are our weaknesses, Satan's going to hit us harder in those areas. So we need to make sure that in the other areas we're doing better so that we can reach that finish line together. Their faith was tired, and there was false doctrine that even came into the church that said, Jesus has already returned. You missed that day. You missed the finish line. Where were you? So as we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, Therefore, I wonder if that's which verse? It's not? 4 8 is where it's at? Okay. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith. They're pers persevering under this. And... and in persecutions and trials that you're enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you're suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give you relief to you who are troubled. As you read through Psalms, you'll see that that's a constant theme in David's Psalms that there are these people in the world that won't live for the kingdom of God, who try to destroy. Again, we fight a spiritual battle. And you've got to realize that God is just. Don't feel like you're getting the wrong end of this deal. You're His children. I know so many times Jacob was like, you, Jacob was my son if you don't know, was like, why'd you discipline me for this and you didn't discipline because they're not my child. <laughs> That's simple. You don't understand that. But yes, I am going to be much harder on you. I don't know if he still understands it or not. But he will one day. That's why I said he will one day. <laughs> he will one day. Okay, so as we read on, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 11, with this in mind, we constantly pray for you. It develops more prayer again. That, you, that our God may make you worthy of His calling. And that by His power we, He may bring to fruition every desire for goodness and your every deep uh, and your every deed, sorry, prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in, glorified in you and you in Him, according to the grace of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. So it brings about more prayer again, because guess what? I can't control anything. Yep, that's right. I can't. It's something I have to keep reminding myself of because I would like to just discipline Jacob and say, this is how it needs to go and this corrected you and it's over with. But that won't happen, will it? It won't happen. Come on, guys. You can't control anything. So you have to be prayerfully dependent. And you don't need to let Satan bring in these doubts into your mind. You need to fix your eyes on Jesus and run the race marked out for you. There were false teachings, like I said, that had infiltrated the church. So chapter 2, verse 1 says, Concerning the, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and being gathered to Him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in this way. Now, I'm going to say this right here, too, because this is typically... What we do as a church so many times is we read that and then we say, well, I won't be deceived by it, but we concentrate on that. Or we read about the Pharisees and we say, well, I don't live like that instead of examining our own hearts and living like that. If you read on, 
in verse 5 it says, Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? You don't know those things. Plain and simple. They knew what Paul was talking about, so they understood it. You don't. So you trying to rationalize what all this terminology means about when the Lord's coming and how it's coming could distract you, okay, from running the race properly. You understand that? Because doctrine is one of the biggest things that divides the church and keeps us from running a race as a whole. I can't worship with you. I can't do this and that. And I'm concentrating on this when we need to be concentrating on loving one another as Christ loved us. So we're not getting the doctrine part here. We're going on because Paul didn't get into it here. In chapter 2, verse 13, God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, through belief in the truth. He called you to this through, through our gospel that you might share in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we pass on to you, whether by word or of mouth or by letter. May our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God our Father who loved us and by His grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Running the race, not in doctrine. We can have those debates and everything, but as a church, we need to be concerned about loving one another and telling them about the kingdom and living a life that shows that. Not being idle, but doing good. Chapter 3, verse 11. We hear that some of you among you are idle and disruptive. They are not busy, they are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food they eat. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. Run this race, run it together as a church, fixing your eyes on Jesus until you reach that finish line. So the church, churches in Galatia were the same story. Paul writes the same thing. And he has to even verify that these letters are coming from him because false teachers are saying, this letter is from Paul. And it's not introducing this false theology. Why? To distract the churches from running their race. And this race that they're running and the persecution that they're facing is actually to build their character, to build their faith, so that when the true testing of their faith will come to the church, that they won't walk away from the faith. As the author of Hebrews says, people are already walking away from the faith. Now, I will say this about the future and theology and stuff. We all think that our freedoms of religion will be persecuted, that it won't be as free as it is today to tell people about Jesus. I believe that. You believe that. So tell people about Jesus today. Because if these people in these churches weren't strengthening their faith, grounding it, anchoring in Jesus, they would have walked away in groves a lot more than they did. Are you firmly planted in your faith, which is in Jesus Christ, the hope that you have, and is it evident in how you're running the race and how you're loving one another? Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. Jesus, He's the one who gave Himself for your sins to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Back to Jesus and fixing your eyes on Him and the race that you have before you. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I could stop right there, but I'll go on just a little further, not too long. You're running this race to bring God glory because of what He did for you. That's your hope. That's what people want to hear from you, and they've got to see it again. I can't just say I love you and not act like it. I've got to live it so that then they see it and say, what is your hope? Tell me about it. Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's where we start in Hebrews. Jesus is greater than the law. Jesus is greater than angels. Jesus is our high priest. Everything else, Jesus, 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 till it permeates your life, and that's why I'm running and nothing's going to stop me because I'm going to run for it because I fixed my eyes on what Jesus did for me and I want to tell everybody about it. So you can see that permeating through this letter. But in chapter 1 you'll read in verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel, running a different race. Well... 
I know this is what I'm supposed to do, but that guy over there, you don't understand what he did to me. I can't forgive him yet. Well, you know, I know this is my race, but I'm tied up with this right here now instead of this. Whatever your excuse is, you're running a race, aren't you? Look at Paul, verse 21. Then I went to Syria and in, in Cilicia. See, I struggle with them, Merle. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard this report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith that he once tried to destroy. Verse 24, And they praise God because of me, because I lived a different life. Doesn't matter who you are. You can't rely on the fact that you went to church or even that you say, I believe. You've got to live it. Paul goes on to talk about, in verse 15, we who are Jews by birth, he had to confront Peter and even Barnabas because of their hypocrisy in the church. They needed each other so they wouldn't fall into these snares that the devil put before them. And in Galatians chapter 2, you get to that verse which you all know because that's what Paul's building up to and that cross again that you're fixing your eyes on that for the joy that Jesus uh, went to the cross. I have been crucified with Christ... I no longer live. It is Christ who lives in me. That's what I said when I started. Jesus did this for you. He said it was finished. He gives you the power of the Holy Spirit to live your life so that He can live through you. It's all about God bringing salvation to mankind and it's all done with Jesus, 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 Jesus. I can say it again. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I'll continue to proclaim Jesus. Jesus, there is no other name. He lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith. How many times was it mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11? I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How can I not give myself to him? I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. If I can't live as a Christian, why did Christ die? If the Holy Spirit comes to reside in me and I have direct access to the Father and through Him I can cry, Abba, my Father in heaven, why do I want, not want to live a life that says that? Do I want to dishonor the cross and what Jesus did? <clears throat> Be careful that your race is not being run in vain. Chapter 3, verse 1, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by the Spirit, you are now trying to finish by means of faith? Man, that should ring out in our ears. Because so many times we pray and we pray and we pray and I'm thinking of my own life, not, not any of yours. And then we say, well, I don't think God's going to answer my prayers. I'll just, go ahead, I'll, just, I'll just go ahead and do this. I think it every day, if you want to know the truth, is every day I get up and say, well, what do I need to do today? You know, that doesn't necessarily leave room for what God wants me to do today. Jesus saved me. Jesus will walk this life with me so that I can bring glory and honor to God. And there's nothing that I'll face that I can't walk through, whether it be a valley of the shadow of death or the mountaintop. I see what Jesus Christ has done. I fix my eyes on Him. He is the reason that I live and breathe. Everything else has been crucified so that I can live. In chapter 3, verse 10, For all who rely on works of the law are still under a curse. As it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. 
Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung upon a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. In chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ would be no value at all. Now, some of the false doctrine here so that you can understand it was that we needed to comply with the law and circumcision was what they were teaching. I needed Jesus plus circumcision. In this race, you're going to be tempted, period, that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, but you don't want people to dis discredit your thought process and say there are other ways also, that you can do it. Whatever it is that snares you, that entangles you, I can't answer that. But you've got to run this race by the power of the Spirit and run it by fixing your eyes on Jesus and run it together. And what a perfect thing for mothers on Mother's Day. Because I know that some of you had good mothers. Some of you did not have good mothers. Some of you have lost your mothers. Some of you have disappointments as far as children go or struggles or anything else. But realize that God called you to be a woman. God called you if He did to be a mother. If He didn't, He didn't call you to be a mother. And that you have a part to play and it involves each and every one. Your children, your siblings, your friends, your family, your church. And that you're running this race together to bring glory to God. And the only way you can do that, that you can run this race, is to run it by the power of the Spirit. Because if you don't, and the reason that I'm glad this came up for Mother's Day is because you'll get distracted by these other things. Broken relationships are what hurts us the most and what God is trying to mend the most. Why did Jesus Christ die but to reconcile us to God and to others? You will know they are my disciples by their love. Galatians chapter 5 Verse 5, For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? The kind of per persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. And to conclude out Galatians, so I say, verse 16, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. The acts of the flesh are obvious, and I'm not going to list them because we're not going to get hung up on there, but you know what yours are especially. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. They'll be running a different race. They'll be disqualified, whatever it is. But the fruit of the Spirit is, first of all, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. You do them, period. The law won't create you to love more or have joy more. The Holy Spirit will create that in you because you are a child of God. Our cross is to love, even if we're not loved. Verse 24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And from chapter 6, verse 7, Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. mocked. A man reaps what he sows. So when you're unforgiving to love, well, I think Jesus talked about that in the Sermon on the Mount, didn't He? Forgive others as you want to be forgiven, correct? <clears throat> Whoever sows to please the flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary. This is a race, a marathon, a group event. 
in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision mean anything. What counts is the new creation. I hope you read those, those letters. I try to do it fast simply because of time, but I wanted to tie together how much this is to where we're at in Hebrews and running this race with perseverance so that we don't give up. Because I guarantee you, each and every day, Satan's going to throw things at you that make you doubt, that make you feel like you're running an inadequate race. You're not competing against anyone else. We're in this together. I don't care if I beat you to the finish line. I care that you make it to the finish line with me. And you should care that to be the same for me. And we should pray for our children and lift each other up and cry when we need to cry and comfort when we need to comfort and love everyone even our enemies. But if we're not loving in our own household, how in the world will we ever love our enemies? If we're not faithful to run when things are eh, how can we ever run faithfully when things are really bad? Fix your eyes on Jesus and run the race that is marked out before each and every one of you. Amen. Father in heaven, I thank you and praise you. I thank you for mothers. Lord, I pray for those mothers today that are troubled. I pray that, Lord, that those that are, are joyous. I pray that you let them realize that, that children are heritage and a blessing from the Lord and that mothers are something that, that you have given them to honor and to value. We know that we don't have perfect relationships with human beings. That's why we fix our eyes on Jesus. We know that, that our love will be hurt here on earth, but we know that your love is perfect. So let us Together, praise your name, worship you, and thank you, and fix our eyes on Jesus until that finish line. Lord, we pray for those that don't know you, and Lord, we pray that through the power of your Spirit, you do transform us through and through, that we will love like Christ. Lord, may we not individually be just those that love you with all of our heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, but let us be a church collectively that loves. I thank you and praise you for the mother that you've given me, and I thank you for the wife that is the mother to my child, and I thank you for this church, this body of believers that is my family. I thank you for them in Christ's name. Amen.